talk later, or, or you can read up while I discuss uh, with everyone else who's here. Uh, so, um, so um, yeah, uh, when, when I designed this platform, um, I really looked at you know very uh, specific use case for blog posts, um, and that is uh, method search. And we'll see what you like. Sorry about that. OK. So uh, yeah, let's start with uh, designing for security. Right? Um, one of the interesting things when you look at you know, security is you know, which programming language can you use? This is a, a picture from, uh, from Microsoft, actually, where they showed uh, you know, of all the bugs that they have in, in their software over the past you know, 12 years, uh, what, which of those are caused by, so, by memory safety issues and which were other types of bugs? So about 70% of all their, their security issues were memory safety issues, right? So uh, sure, I mean, uh, if you are really focused on something and working on your own, and you can probably write like memory safe C, uh, but doing it at, at a scale of a large company is or just any large project. It's just basically impossible. Um, so that's uh, why I think Rust is the, the best way to go for secure enclaves, right? You're, you have this, this kind of minimal uh, environment, so you probably can't pull in all the dependencies that you would need for like a JVM or, or, uh, or, or, or something like that. Um, so you're kind of stuck with choosing something like lower level uh, but, uh, you know, of course, this is, you, you've identified something you want to be super secure. Um, so, so why, why you see, right? So we're using Rust. Uh, so some of the cool features of Rust are uh, guaranteed memory and type safety. Uh, there, there's like static analysis by, built right into the compiler, right? Uh, 25 years of, of programming languages uh, and, and static analysis research uh, that is just right available right there. Um, very good way to deal with errors, uh, right? So you cannot ignore errors in Rust, but it's it's not it's not hard to deal with them either. So that's really good. Uh, very good concurrency uh, primitives, and uh, like I said, basically no runtime. Right? You can just compile it down to the bare metal, which is what we need to do in in this environment. Okay. So the next thing that we're thinking about, you know, when you're designing something uh, for security purposes is like the interface that you expose to the outside world, right? The interface is like the number one attack point uh, for, for an adversary. Uh, so you better like think, think long and hard about like what, what are you going to expose there and uh, how are you going to deal with, with whatever an attacker might throw at you, uh, right? So. If you if you use an interface like a, a func binary function call interface, like you might find in uh, uh, you know just any like the C calling convention or even like the Linux syscall calling convention, it's very hard to get these things correct. Uh, you, you can have variable variable length structures. You can have time of check to time of use issues. You can have padding issues uh, and and things like that. Right, so. Uh, regarding the padding issue, you know, this was an issue with the Intel SGX SDK, so this is now an excerpt from the developer guide from Intel where they say, okay, you know, you've got to be aware, you don't put padding in the structures that you're using in your Enclave interface. Uh, another uh, thing from, from uh, Intel's manual or Intel's uh, uh, developer guide, uh, right, uh, they, they had this 
functionality to allow you to uh, specify like variable length inputs, uh, well, that's that's gone now, right? So, um, why why are we trying to mimic these these C type interfaces uh, across an interface that's just not compatible uh, or well compatible, uh, like not not suitable for it, um, right? So uh, I would say you know. Look, look somewhere else, right? If you look at network services, they are designed to work with untrusted inputs, right? Like everyone has some web servers and they're connected to the internet and right, they have been for 30 years and they're like really focused on dealing with untrusted inputs. Um, so why not do the same, right? So in, in, in the EDP, uh, we just provide a byte stream abstraction. Uh, and then you can run any protocol you want on top of that. Uh, including like TLS or not, right? Um, but you can run gRPC or HTTP or anything like that. And you know, you might think that a reason for not running like a full protocol like that is is that parsing is hard. And, you know, we're an enclave; we don't want to deal with like parsing issues. But you know, if you're using anything but C, parsing is actually easy, right? Um, so that's not a reason not to use it. Okay, um, so uh, moving on to the, to the threat model, you know, if you're talking about network services, this is what you can think of, right? You can basically uh, get your, your, your remote compute infrastructure from anywhere. It doesn't matter as long as they have this secure enclave capability, it runs on the server. You don't trust the administrator, you don't trust the server, right? So this is like a cloud provider or anything. Uh, you trust, of course, the client and the user um, and, um, for, for secure enclaves, specifically, kind of, you know, we're not considering availability here, uh, but uh, you can, of course, get availability by, by deploying your things in a, like a redundant fashion across multiple providers or something like that. Um, so the, the secure enclave is the network server. That is what you would, what, what, how, how you need to think about this here, right? Uh, so. You, you're not talking to like a host that has is running some server, but it, you're talking to directly to the secure enclave, right? Um, so, how does that integrate with remote attestation? Well, easy, right? Uh, client connects to the secure enclave. There's some uh, there's a uh, some protocol that you do where you verify, you know, is this a real software that I'm trying to run? Is running on a legit platform? Something like that, uh, and then uh, you can move on. So, um, in, in a very, uh, you know, first, first idea of like how you would implement this, maybe you can like uh, save the hash of your, of your, uh, that you expect on the server side in your client program and you verify that, um, you verify that when you do this connection. Uh, this works, right? But, but now you really, you, you have an issue because you can't do updates on the server side. Uh, and you need you need like one client per service like every because the, the identity of the server is baked into the client you need a different client every all the time right so uh, we have a, this ability to to verify the code identity on the on the server side but how do we know which which identity we want here uh, that's 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 a big question um, but this is uh, something that you can solve in a different way, right? So, uh, like I said, we, it's a byte stream abstraction, so we can, we can just use TLS. So, if we take a private, TLS private key and, and assign it to the enclave, and then make sure that the enclave never exposes this private key to the, pub, to the world, right? Uh, then, if you are able to establish a secure channel and the, the enclave identifies itself using its private key, uh, you know you're talking directly to the enclave, right? Because the secure enclave is only the only one that has access to this key. Um, so um, you don't actually need to do a, a, a live remote attestation challenge uh, if you use this uh, scheme. Uh, you can just, you know, attest to the, the, the public enclave. The enclave can, can have its public key attested to once, and then you can rely on that going forward. And then you can just set up a standard TLS connection, right? So this makes the whole life a whole lot easier because uh, now you can use, uh, you don't have to write your own custom protocols to do security and things like that. Um, so similarly to like how a, um, a standard 
TLS certificate kind of binds a subject name to a TLS public key, you can use an attestation to bind the public key to a software. So now we have a binding all the way from subject name to, to the enclave, um, right? So you can, you can use this in, in your trust model. So when you say, I'm going to a particular web service like mywebmail.com, okay? I know that you know, mywebmail.com is actually running a particular piece of software. Um, so um, right, through, hop through the certificate and then through the attestation, you, you know the, exactly the server-side software that's running on mywebmill.com. Um, so uh, like you can't do something like the lava bit thing, right, where, where the, the private key is leaked uh, or, or ordered to be leaked uh, because the private key is not owned by a human, it's owned by the enclave. And you know that the software that you've written that's running in the enclave, it cannot, like, it will not release the private key, right? So when, when the enclave starts, you just uh, check, you know, do I have a valid private key? If not, I'll make one. And then do I, do I have a valid certificate? If not, you know, I output a certificate signing request. And then I just, you know, once I get the certificate, I can, I can run, I can be a TLS server. Uh, okay, so that's the services part, uh, like and how, how you integrate services with enclaves. Um, so then, um, talking about you know portability and ease of use. Um, if you want to write, run an Intel SGX enclave, all you need to do is write a simple Rust program, and I'll show you that in a bit. Uh, and that's because uh, the Rust standard library uh, upstream includes a. Uh, a backend for for SGX that that uh, we wrote, um, and uh, so you can just uh, Rust has very good support for cross compilation, um, so you can easily just you know install the standard library for this other target, compile for this SGX target, and now your program is just running, uh, or is a is able to run in an enclave, um, right? So a lot of people or a lot of designs for for using enclaves. Um, they make you think about splitting your application in halves. Like one half runs outside the enclave, one, hi one half runs inside. Um, <coughs> but you know, then you need to write two, two pieces of software. So that's a lot of work. Um, so because of the simple byte stream interface that, that you know, I defined as the enclave interface, we only need, ever need to write the piece that runs outside the enclave once. And you can reuse that for all enclaves. Uh, right, so this is just available. You can just install that. Uh, once and you can run all the enclaves, um, and then uh, right, the, the, this runner program is just in charge of uh, shuttling traffic around between the outside world and the enclave, right? Because it's just forwarding a byte stream, right? So if you have a TCP listening server or something like that, right, that needs to run outside the enclave. It interacts with the OS to do that. Uh, when you get any connection, that gets passed through the enclave and. Uh, read and write operations are just passed directly through. Um, so it also means that you know, this enclave uh, is kind of like independent of like the operating system, right? Because it doesn't depend on, on anything. So uh, you can use the same enclave on, on all OSs uh, easily. Um, cool, so there was a bit of a whirlwind <laughs> of the overview of like, you know, the thoughts that I put into like designing the system. Um, so um, uh, yeah, you take SGX, you take Rust, you take a, a service, a uh, network service idea, you combine it, and that's what, uh, what the Enclave development platform is. Um, website is edp.fortanix.com, you can download everything there. Um, and there's like a quick guide, a quick start guide and everything. So in the future, we're gonna work on supporting SGX2 and, and other extensions that are come upcoming. Uh, we're gonna do better support for uh, asynchronous IO. So Rust has very good support for, for uh, asynchronous IO using futures. Uh, so that's gonna be supported soon. And I'm looking at like adding some binary analysis tools so that you know once you've built the enclave, you want to like make sure that certain things got compiled correctly um, uh, to guard against uh, miscompilations and programmer errors. Uh, just in, again to add like another layer of security on top of this this interface for the enclave. Um, okay, so let's move to a quick demo. Um, 
here, uh, one of the tools that uh, is available is just, you know, checking if your system is configured correctly to run SGX, right? So it says SGX detect tool, uh, and it will just check everything. Do I have it enabled in the BIOS? Do I have the right uh, system software installed? Do I have the driver? All that stuff. Um, then uh, here, uh, it looks like we're not running a piece that's needed uh, on, uh, on older systems. Um, so, you know, Intel, uh, uh, I'll get to that in a bit. So we'll just start, start the software that's not running. And then if you run it again, you can see, okay, you know, I was able to launch Enclaves. Good, you're good to go. Um, so why do you need this AESM service? Uh, well, on Intel processors before, like late 2018, uh, it, there was actually like a DRM built into SGX so you can run your own software. But that's all gone now. If you buy a new enough processor, you can run whatever enclaves you want without Intel's whitelist. Um, okay, so let's run some actual enclave code, right? Um, so I'll just do a simple Hello World demo here first, right? So I'll just, you know, write a standard Rust Hello World. Um, it, you know, it's just the standard thing you get when you start first start a Rust project. Uh, main function, print hello, okay, run it. So I just ran it for Linux. Cargo run, because I, I, I was running this on Linux, right? So, uh, but now I'll just run it on SGX. So all I need to do is specify that I'm cross-compiling to a different target. Uh, the uh, Protanix on OSGX target, run it, boom. Okay, so the, the command to print hello world to, to the screen here, that actually was, came from inside the enclave. Is, is the type credible? I'm sorry? Is the timing credible here? Is the did timing? It, did it really take a split second to Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in this, in this, this, this is really fast. Uh, in the next video, I have, Sped up the compilation a bit, but this this is this is actually how how fast it is, is it really is yeah um, yeah um, okay so uh, well but uh, this is just a hello world program I told you I was wanted to write net like network services so let's let's do that right um, I'm gonna use the uh, hyper library uh, which is a standard <coughs> way sorry. Nope, I'm not using the rocket library, uh, which is this way to write uh, um, web applications in Rust. Um, and then while I'm editing this file to add the rocket dependency to my project, I'm also gonna configure uh, that I want a certain number of threads. So in uh, uh, version one of SGX, you, there's a maximum number of threads that you have, have to specify uh, at, at build time. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, uh, yeah, for, to, in order to uh, to use Rocket, you need to enable some some features in Rust. Um, <coughs> I'm gonna import the uh, the Rocket uh, crate. The crate is basically what what is a, a library in other languages. Um, so I'm just defining the uh, slash hello endpoint for my API, uh, right? Because we're we're doing hello world here. Uh, so instead of um, uh, Printing it to the screen, I'm just going to return hello world, you know, as the output of my API here. Um, and then in my main function, I'm just going to run the, uh, uh, the web server with this one endpoint here. Um, Yeah, no, uh, depends on what you do, right? So uh, he had, the question was, you don't need to use macro use anymore. Uh, macro use, um, you need it if you don't explicitly import the macro you're using using a use statement. Uh, so macro use is like a, a blanket import of all macros from a Rust crate. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, it's compiled it. At, like I said, this was a little bit sped up, but uh, you know, you can see it's running uh, on port 8000. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, that's it, right? We just, uh, we just built a web server a web, web application that's completely contained in the enclave running in, inside a, a, a SGX enclave. Yeah? So Cargo, I think normally it will, uh, so, so all these crates can be compiled in parallel, uh, well, depending on how your dependency tree looks, right? So it will just fill up your, uh, your, your CPUs, but, but sorry, so this was sped up because, you know, I don't want to, wait here during our, my presentation for everything to compile. Another one was the your own function when you return the string, 
Yeah. Uh, so this uh, this was actually doing a plain text response. Uh, so yeah, I was just returning a, a string. Uh, so in 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 Rust, uh, um, there's difference between like references and owned objects. So um, that's that's why that was there. I'll talk about it more later. Yeah. Uh, any other questions so far? Uh, yeah, well, I, I didn't, wouldn't necessarily call it serialization, deserialization, um, right? So, so um, th there's a special calling convention that, that is defined um, and um, that has uh, uh, like a bunch of calls defined, uh, right? So this is the full list of all the uh, what is called user calls, right? So when the enclave needs to call out, it needs to go to user space, so I call it a user call, and then, right, you can then forward that to the system, uh, right? So this is this is the whole list of all the user calls that is supported uh, right now, um, and this is like sufficient to build basically any network service. Um, yeah, so you have the standard primitives like uh, read, write, and uh, you know there's some networking stuff to to op open streams, and then some some. Uh, uh, event management and some some memory management, and then that, that's basically basically it. Uh, yo. Uh, if I heard correctly, this server on top of HTTP. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so the the, the example that I just showed was uh, unencrypted HTTP, uh, right? So if you, depending on like. Your security model, you probably you might want to use HTTPS instead, um, but yeah. What would be the advantage of running the server in an enclave if the output is a little bit different? Well, um, so it, uh, it it depends, uh, right? So when you're running a, a network uh, server, you might, uh, um, in addition to um, like all the protected APIs that you want to do over TLS, you might have some management APIs, like you know stop the server or something like that, uh, right? So there's no security needed because that's uh, availability is out of scope, um, right? So that can just be given by anyone who has access to the host system. Uh, so then you, can, you could do that over HTTP instead of HTTPS because, yeah, that doesn't really matter, right? But then you wouldn't want to expose that over the network probably, um, right? Yeah, you could use a reverse proxy, of course, but you know, as soon as you, uh, um, if you want to use, um, if you were planning on using TLS for security, right, you want the TLS connection to be terminated inside the enclave, uh, because otherwise you get can easily do a man-in-the-middle attack between the proxy and the enclave. Yeah. And I assume that at this point you do have to do the complex thing that the, to, to validate that the thing that you request is, 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 is indeed your code. Not yeah, yeah. So you know, there's two different ways. There's a couple different ways you can go about it. Oh, uh, sorry, to, I'll repeat the question. The question was um, uh, I showed a slide uh, about uh, you know issuing certificates. Um, at at uh, certificate issuance time, do you need to do like any complex validation? Yeah. So. Um, you could, uh, like one approach you can take is that your CA is in charge of checking at the station. So uh, then you need to make sure that, you know, when you get your certificate signing request, it contains uh, an, ex an extension that, you know, also includes, includes the attestation that might include the public key, and you verify that the public key is the same as the public key in the certificate signing request. You verify the attestation, you verify that against the list of software that you trust or something like that. Uh, and then only then do you actually issue the certificate. Uh, that's one way you can do that. Um, there, there's other ways where you can like publish all the attestations in like a public repository, um, so that clients can go and check that in addition to checking the certificate. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, 
So uh, no, currently we don't really have any any plans on on having uh, uh, that kind of functionality uh, as part of the uh, this project. Yeah. Um, um, all right. I mean, the, we do have the the, the 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 standard attestation primitives that you get from Intel SGX and like how you can use those. Um, and um, uh, yeah, but no like. CA server or something like that. Yeah. Uh, it depends on on. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, depends on like how complex the policies you want are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, given all of the ability to expect data of SGX these days, um, does that hold true? Yeah, so that's a good question. You know, we have seen a lot of vulnerabilities. Oh, yeah, sorry, you're right. Sorry, I'll repeat the question. Okay, so we're putting a private key inside the enclave. Um, given all the attacks we've seen on, on SGX, uh, you know, do you think it's reasonable to expect that you can actually keep the private, enclave, sorry, the private key secure? Um, yeah, so there there have been lots of attacks, uh, but uh, generally um, they've been able to be patched uh, with uh, microcode updates. Um, actually, there was a, some report earlier this week uh, on, um, uh, on 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 uh, uh, was a cash out attack. Uh, but uh, if you go read the paper, you can see that uh, the the researcher had hyper threading enabled, uh, which you know is no longer uh, kind of if you use remote attestation. With SGX, if you have hyper-threading enabled, it will no longer pass uh, remote attestation. So uh, that's the, the, the. I believe that the attack that, that the attack that was shown last week it doesn't actually work against the standard SGX environment anymore. Um, so so, uh, but yeah, to get back to your question, yeah, you, like once an attack is discovered, of course you can leverage it to extract a private key. So SGX has this uh, TCB recovery mechanism, right, where you need to. Uh, basically update to the latest version of everything and then provision some new keys. So you can do the same thing here. Uh, right? So you need to use short-lived certificates, uh, but that's, that's already standard practice these days, right? So if you use like Let's Encrypt or something like that, you know that uh, if you keep patching everything, you know, within three months you'll have an, a valid certificate again for, for like the latest updates. Um, so, yes, somehow, right? So, um, uh, if you can tie the, the um, um, so the, the microcode version is uh, checked as part of remote attestation, um, right? So, as long as you know that you have a new enough remote attestation that is valid, uh, then you know you were on a new enough microcode. So you need to buy, yeah, that's, so you just need to get a new TLS private key and then you're good. So, um, right, uh, um, so, so you need to build somewhere in your, in your trust verification mechanism to ensure that, you know, there's a way to get, like, that the attestation that was used for this private key is not too old. Uh, sorry, I forgot to repeat the question, but I think it might have been clear from context. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, yeah, go. Um, possibly. So currently, um, there's not a lot of off-the-shelf hardware available with with security capabilities that are as good as SGX, um, right? So SGX gives you. Um, like integrity protected uh, memory encryption, so you really only have to uh, to trust the, the 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 one CPU chip and not like the rest of the motherboard and the supply chain and everything. Uh, it gives you um, multiplexing, right? So multiple secure enclaves that are isolated from each other as well. 
Um, and um, yeah, so if you look at other technologies like uh, Trust Zone or uh, the recently announced uh, AMD SEV SMP, um, you just don't quite get get there yet. Um, but uh, uh, you know, once once it makes sense to to support uh, new cool technologies that are probably going to come out, uh, yeah, I'll definitely look at it. Uh, right. So the goal is to do the same thing. Uh, uh, do the same thing, right? Where we just, you know, make it ma make a small, like run run the same code in 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 the enclave and have like a small proxy, um, yeah, just to run the same thing. Um, yeah. So sorry. The question was, should I support or are we going to support uh, other enclave technologies? Uh, okay. So um, am I doing on time? Five minutes, okay. So uh, um, I'm just going to show real quick the, the next step, right? I just showed a very simple uh, API, but now I want to do some, some JSON computation type thing. So I'm going to add, um, add some dependencies on uh, Surti. Surti is uh, Rust's uh, serialization, deserialization framework. It's, uh, I would say, the best way to, do, to serialize data in any language. It it's, it's works really conveniently and easy. Um, and interacts very well with the type system. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, I'm just going to import uh, these extra uh, crates that I added as dependencies. Uh, and then I'm going to define a, a type. Uh, or I'm going to import some more stuff. Um, Yeah, so I'm going uh, I'm I'm going to define a type uh, that implements uh, deserialize, right? So I'll be able to to turn JSON into this type. Uh, the type is called two vectors, which means I'm going to call hold two vectors in the mathematical sense, um, and um, uh, because uh, the function I'm going to implement is the uh, dot dot product, uh, right? So uh, I'm going to pass in uh, two vectors in JSON and then compute the dot product and output it again. So, oh, sorry. I said I meant cross product. <laughs> um, right, so uh, I, just, I just have to define the API here. So the previous API was at slash hello. This one is at slash cross. Uh, as input, I'm going to take this JSON value um, of type two vectors, and I'm going to output JSON value again. Um, and then uh, I just need to. Um, uh, kind of yeah, get these two values a and b from the JSON um, from the input, compute the uh, compute the uh, cross product, the output, and then uh, yeah, send that on back to the to the client. Uh, so this is going to be like maybe like another ten lines of code or so. Uh, so here I need to figure out what the right elements are to multiply. Don't worry, I'm coming back to uh, to change the indices. <laughs> uh, uh, and then uh, last thing, I just need to add uh, the uh, API to the list of APIs that my web server supports. Okay, save, quit, compile, run. <clears throat> okay, um, so yeah, I'm just running, compiling the rest. Normally, uh, on my laptop, this takes about five minutes, so you know. <laughs> But here we're on uh, presentation time. Uh, so yeah, I mean here again, I'm just running the API with some input data, and then we'll see that it works. You know, defensive security demo is always so boring because it's just you know you should just show that something is working. <laughs> um, yeah, well there we go. The cross product of one two three and four five six is minus three six minus three. Uh, compute it inside an enclave. So if you, know, you had a more uh, sensitive computation where you wanted to be sure that it was correct and you couldn't do it on the client, you might, you might use this. Could you just tell us about which type of resources and about mission? Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, okay. Uh, the question is why shouldn't we use this? It, this, this framework is very big and we sh you shouldn't use it because of that. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, you know, you have to make certain trade-offs when you're building security software. Uh, I think here, um, letting the programmer use familiar, primitives that are familiar to them lets them folk, like, build software in a more, in, in a more common way. Uh, right, so that makes it more accessible uh, to people. So people, uh, you know, they might they might have some familiarity with like building a, a web service with an API that is somewhat secure. Um, so this lets them do that. Uh, yeah, you get you get a slightly larger TCB, um, but um, uh, you know I think that's that's uh, countered by uh, like the the using the Rust language. Uh, having a very well-defined and uh, uh, interface that is very small and, and interpretable. Uh, yeah. So. Any other questions? <coughs> oh uh, yeah. So in terms of future developments, uh, there was a, so I uh, uh, mentioned you know support for upcoming features in SGX and, and Rust and binary analysis already. Uh, in the future, we might support you know different platforms when when those are uh, you know uh, have grown up to be as good as SGX uh, and uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. So should there be other architectures that actually have an enclave similar to yours? Yes, there should be. I assume, <laughs> I assume that there should be a process in place where they, the people behind the software support for that can get in touch with the Rust community and you. Similar people to have abstractions put in place for their architecture to be accommodated. Is there a process for that, or is it just going to be like the usual? Uh, okay, so uh, the question is um, if there are uh, uh, you know new architectures that want like similar support for this type of enclaves in Rust, uh, how should they go about doing that? Um, yeah, so the Rust uh, community uh, is basically just pull request based. <laughs> um, so no, or of that? no, no, no. So, so currently, the, yeah, in Rust, if you want to add a new target, they're they're super flexible about it. Um, you know, maybe once the grit list grows to 100, uh, they'll they'll get put a more uh, bigger process in place. Uh, but right now, it's just uh, yeah, you send a pull request. Uh, if you need any like. Uh, Help or advice uh, on like building a new target that is like similar to this. I'm happy to help. Um, there's a uh, Slack channel uh, that I'm generally available on. You can find the link on our website. Uh, so this is a Slack channel for for SGX expert and things like that. Uh, so yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.